Hello and welcome to the show. I'm your host, Jason Knight, and on each episode of this podcast, I'll be having inspiring conversations with passionate product people. I'll be talking to thought leaders and practitioners in and around product management to help you build the right products and build them right. If that sales pitch wasn't too shabby, let's go through to the next round together. After this episode, you can head over to onenightinproduct.com where you can sign up to the mailing list, subscribe on your favorite podcast app, or follow the podcast on your favorite social media platform and guarantee you never miss another episode again. On tonight's episode, we see what sparks fly when the unthinkable happens and a product manager speaks to a salesman. And no, that's not the beginning of a bad joke. We talk about some of the predictable tensions between product management and sales teams, where they come from, and whether we can solve them. We talk about sales versus product discovery and whether it's true that salespeople only care about the deal in front of them. We also try to work out if sales is just like the movies and whether our guest is up for a Cadillac, a set of steak knives, or if he's getting fired. More up-to-date film references are available on request. For all this and much more, please join us on One Night in Product. So my guest tonight is Brendan McAdams. Brendan was a former volunteer fireman turned salesman and B2B SaaS consultant who described having his aortic valve replaced as one of the best experiences of his life, which proves two things, that Brendan's totally hardcore and also salespeople do have hearts. Brendan's the author of Salescraft, a practical guide to getting good at sales, and he's here tonight to help us answer the perennial question, can sales and product get along? I've got high hopes, although he's already given me the evil eye, and I seem to have at least 15 new questions on my list that I didn't agree to. Hi Brendan, how are you tonight? Uh, good to be here, Jason. Thanks. No worries. I'd like to get a few digs into the salesman start. Yeah, just to get it going. Right? Put you in the right mood. So, first things first, you're the managing director at Kinetic out in Baltimore. Now, I believe that to be a sales and marketing consultancy, but what problem does Kinetic solve for me? Well, it's been for a long period of time, I was a, kind of a fractional sales VP, chief revenue officer. And about a year ago, I started a pivot to doing more sales coaching and sales consulting for early stage startups. I kind of fundamentally believe that early stage founders need to be able to sell. They can't afford salespeople <laughs> in the early going, and they're disinclined to want to sell in a lot of cases. They're oftentimes very technical, and so they tend to focus on the product development and building as opposed to understanding what their market wants and doesn't want. And so I did a pivot in the last year. And so now I'm doing more sales coaching for early stage companies. And is that exclusively early stage companies or are you kind of going in and trying to help maybe scale ups and even bigger yeah. companies to try and sort themselves out as well? Yeah, I'm, I'm actually doing some work right now with a, with a large healthcare technology company that's not a, you know, it's 25 years old and so forth. And I'm actually coaching their entire sales team. And so, no, I'm not exclusive, but, you know, it's important to pick a niche. And so yeah, I think there's a, a real need in the, among creators and, you know, tech founders to understand. And in fact, the, the book was kind of part of the motivation for that is that several people told me that this was a good book for tech founders. Well, yeah, there's a lot of commentary on social media these days about how tech founders need to be able to market, for example, and they can't get anywhere about marketing a little bit about how they can't get anywhere about supply chains and worrying about how they actually could deliver this stuff. So I guess you know, selling is just the inevitable next trend that they're going to have to get on top of as well. Because again, as you say, if you can't sell it, you're not going to make any money out of it, right? Right, right. And you can spend a lot of time, a lot of, waste a lot of time building the wrong thing early on. Yeah, absolutely. But your history is in B2B sales. So what sort of stuff have you been selling in your career? I mean, you're obviously consulting now, but back when you were out there doing it day by day, what was it? What sort of stuff have you sold? Enterprise software, relational database software, data management software for, well, for the first was for Informix and then for Veritas, large systems integration projects for EDS and, and then healthcare data management solutions, you know, like data warehousing. So. Lots of different stuff. And then, and then I got into much more into healthcare, and then it was a lot of transaction processing stuff, EDI and claims processing, all the kind of standard healthcare transactions. And is it fair to say you were indexing quite highly on big sort of enterprise sales and high ACV contracts and yeah. that sort of sales or, or any kind of lower end sales as well? Then a little lower end sales, but a lot, most of my 
most of my selling was large ticket, multi-year enterprise, you know, in a lot of cases, exclusive deals, six, seven, eight figure deals. Yeah, big bonus stuff. That's probably why you got such a nice car, right? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and you enjoy sales so much that you wrote a book about it as well, which I know you've got in your hand and I've got sitting behind me as well, because, you know, I like to support people that come on this podcast. But I mean, we we're chatting about this before the call. It's like, it seems to be a very practical book. It's a book that doesn't really go too much into sales theory and going into trying to work out which very specific acronym to be yeah. going through to all the right. qualification stages and stuff. It's a much more practical book, which seems to be aimed at helping people who maybe don't know all of the practical parts of sales, like you know, how to get to the meeting, how to talk to people, how to manage themselves, how to like, there's even stuff in there about like not eating certain things or ordering certain things at restaurants because you don't want to spill them down your shirt, right? So it's like a really practical kind of field guide to sales. Yeah. So who's it aimed at? The way it got started is I I've always wanted to write a book or a couple books. And so it's at some level, it's kind of a bucket list thing for me. But also, I basically collected little anecdotes and observations, things that I oftentimes either I thought were really important to the sales process, or they're things that were oftentimes ignored in the sales process that, that other salespeople didn't do. And I just thought were fundamentally important. And I think a, a lot of salespeople are, you know, when they become good at it, they're oftentimes become naturally good at it and don't know why. And so what I try <laughs> to do is capture a lot of the things that I think are kind of fundamental, simple steps that can make the process easier for anybody. And what ultimately happened is several people came up to me and said, you know, this would be a good book for tech founders uh, because there are a lot of fundamental steps that I think are actionable and take a lot of the mystery out of sales. Yeah. So I guess the question is obviously, given that it doesn't go into all of the deep theory of some of these frameworks, whether you then, for example, recommend going on to some other framework books after, you know, like the Challenger Sale or some of the other books out there that are aimed at actually unpicking every single stage of the sales process and laying it all out and giving you checklists and playbooks. Like, is there a book that you think is a natural companion to this? Well, I, I, I'm, I grew up in the strategic selling era and, you know, and blue sheets and, and, you know, and understand if you understand the, the just mapping out the sales process. And with, when I was using that, and in fact, that that's a story that ends up in the book is I spend time with large accounts mapping out the various organizations and the players and what their drivers are and those sorts of things. And I found that visual element, that that planning element to be really useful to help me develop my strategy and and make sure that all the bases were covered, as they say, and red flags and that sort of stuff. So so I think that the strategic selling period of time, that kind of mentality or that kind of process resonated with me. You know, Challenger selling is a little bit of old wine in a new bottle to me. <laughs> and uh, I bet you could sell it. I could, yeah. It's the, you know, the spin selling, <laughs> you know, they're all, they all sort of accomplish the same. The objectives are largely the same. So I, I tend to kind of focus on the fundamentals that I think, you know, you can oftentimes, you know, make them as simple as you can, but no simpler, right? And, and I think in a lot of cases, we overcomplicate the sales process. I do go into some philosophy stuff where you, and we, we kind of talked about this before the call started, was that the importance of being able to walk away from a deal. And I think there's a yeah. philosophical, psychological component to that, that, fr that quite frankly, I think will resonate and uh, appeal to a lot of product management people, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll come back to that in a minute, because I do have a question on that. But sure, I guess another question about the book, just before we move on, is like you've touched on, for example, wanting to help out tech founders and You've touched on, of course, helping salespeople kind of up their game and get to grips with some of the stuff that they'll need to be doing. But are there any other people that you'd recommend read this book? Like, is it a general business book that anyone could get value out of? Or do you think it's really focused on like those two niches or, or somewhere in between? One of my observations about uh, spending, spending time on Twitter in particular is <laughs> people often use the words marketing when they actually mean sales. And it's, yeah. and it's because Marketing is so much more attractive than sales. It seems much more sophisticated, I guess, and less manipulative, although I, you could argue that. But in, <laughs> in any case, I think most people have to be able to sell. I think it's really helpful to be able to sell. And the way I wrote the book was to make it digestible and resonate with people 
regardless of whether or not they were carrying a bag. I mean, yeah. one of the things I talk about is thank you notes and showing up on time and being prepared and how you go about being prepared and having things like a, a sales toolkit in place. So those things are transferable to being, you know, uh, a graphic artist, you know, or, um, yeah. or an author. So I think the book is, is kind of very uh, digestible. It's a lot of, there are a lot of stories and examples and most of it's pretty digestible. Sounds like a bit of a Dale Carnegie, you know, uh, business etiquette type book almost under the covers as well, right? Like telling people how to be respectful to other people's time and, and stuff like that. So yeah, kind of an interesting additional angle as well as the actual selling part. Yeah. I, I, I've been through so many sales calls where you take an hour because you have an hour and it mm -hmm. drives me nuts. Like it just, yeah. there's no reason to waste people's time. If you can get the call done in 20 minutes and and then be done and, and be effective, You've that's a gift to the other person. And yet it's so often that people feel like they've got, they've got an hour, they booked an hour, they're going to use up the whole thing and waste everybody's time and then rush to the end. And to me, that's one of those things that give salespeople a bad name. Yeah, well, let's try and dispel a few more bad names about salespeople as well. But on that bad name, I think it is fair to say that one of the cliches about salespeople and this is something that's obviously from the movies, so maybe not 100% accurate, but at the same time, I'm sure those movies were based on someone, right? You've kind of got your Alec Baldwin, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, Coffees for Closers, like real ball buster, take no prisoners. Is that the world of sales that you recognize? Or have you ever been in a situation like that in the past? I've been in more, in, in somewhat high pressure sorts of quarterly and monthly sales environments they don't appeal to me <laughs> and I don't find them to be particularly productive. And so I've always kind of gravitated to the larger enterprise type sales where you, where trust is really important, where reliability and relationships play a much bigger role. And I find those things to make the sales process and the, the experience much more rewarding. And it allows me to differentiate myself. And I, I had a conversation with a, a fellow I was coaching yesterday where we actually talked about the pricing and importance of pricing versus other things. And a big part of sales is the salesperson's ability to add value to the conversation and the, and the solution. And if you can do that, yeah. pricing becomes less and less of an issue and it validates your role in the process. If you can make price a secondary or tertiary priority, then you're effective as a salesperson because you're you're understanding what the real drivers are, and they're not. It's not typically price unless you're in a, a, a truly in a commodity market where you're selling iron or <laughs> or orange juice. You know, it's it's not a commodity. But have you ever worked in a commodity type market? I mean, obviously you've been a lot in enterprise sales, but like, has there ever been any point, maybe as you were coming up, where you had to kind of operate in that different? kind of milieu and that was something that you then stepped away from or did you just step away from it from the start? I don't think I ever really did anything in a commodity role anyway. And you could argue that there's no such thing. And that is different orange juice has different grades and the follow-up and, and how responsible you are and reliable you are as a salesperson can make the price less of an issue and and so forth. I was listening to a Naval talk about the importance of ethics. And in the short term in sales, ethics doesn't matter, right? Because you want the best, <laughs> you just want to get the deal. Yeah. But in the long term, if you play the long game, ethics is really important because people come to find out that you're very reliable and they'll bring you deals and they know they're going to get a fair deal. They know that it's going to be, it's going to be equitable and you stand behind whatever it is you're doing. And consequently, price then becomes a non-issue. So even if you're in a commodity market, you could argue that there's really no such thing. Yeah, I think that's super interesting, that concept of ethics, because I guess people are only really going to buy from you once, right? If they feel that you've kind of hoodwinked them, or if, you, if they feel that you're, yeah. again, being untrustworthy, or just selling like a bag of sand instead of you know, the precious minerals that, you, that they thought they were getting, yeah, they're not going to come back, right? Right. You, you're going to fool people. There's a certain number of people you're going to be you're going to be able to fool for some period of time. And it's a big, the internet's a big place. So you could probably fool <laughs> enough people, but, but it, it does make the job a lot harder because 
what I find is most of my customers come to me because they hear about me from somebody else. I don't, I don't actively market in a, in a aggressive way. And so most of my clients come to me from word of mouth, you know, from someone else. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. But I think it's fair to say that there's a bit of a, an ongoing tension between product managers and salespeople in a number of organizations. Like you don't have to look too far. And, you know, I've certainly felt it in my career. I'm sure you felt it in your career. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, we're looking at each other a bit funny right now, in fact. So, you know, it's definitely <laughs> there. It's like two budgies attacking each other in a cage. But you've obviously worked with product managers in the past. So what are some of the ways that you like to bridge the gap with them? I mean, excluding any ways that they may wish to bridge the gap with you, like from your perspective, from a sales perspective, what do you like to do to get on board with them? At one level, one of the reasons why I've always liked enterprise sales is it's, it's, it's really kind of a team sport. You're as good as your team. It helps to have a very good salesperson right, leading things because they're orchestrating. But at the same time, that salesperson knows that they're really only good as the other members of the team. It's, and so, so if you can bring in other people at the right time and they can, it's, it's much better for me to bring in a product manager that knows the product and can speak to certain functions or capabilities of the product or the, or the product roadmap. It just makes so much more sense for that message to be delivered from somebody other than me even or or if I'm quoting, it's better off to even quote the product manager, for example. So I, I yeah, I've definitely seen instances, lots of instances where there's a, a difficulty between product management, product marketing, marketing and sales. And it's it's oftentimes due to it could be a lot of things. It could be the different compensation and and incentives that are in place, a bad incentive system. For salespeople can make uh, the lives lives of product management and marketing miserable, and can can effectively run the company into the ground if you know if it's if they're bad enough. At the same time, there are a lot of instances where you know product people don't get out in the field enough, so they don't see what customers are in need of and how they interpret the product and so forth. And so, one of the things I always like to do in, in my enterprise days was I'd bring product management out and marketing people out and get them to talk to customers directly to see how the products were being used, what they wanted, what they liked, what they didn't. You know, it just, it made them, it gave them a, you know, firsthand experience, which as a salesperson, one of the big values that salespeople have is they're the ones, they're the front line talking to customers all the time, oftentimes way more than marketing people are. And so they know how the products are being used and, and what works and what doesn't. and you know, and what what competitors are doing. So it, it really behooves a company to have a good relationship between between those folks. But a typical complaint that you'll get from some product people, and again, I've seen this myself before, so I know it's not just anecdotal, although I guess this technically is an anecdote as well, is that you get salespeople that will be so desperate to win a deal because they want to get that new car or whatever, I guess, or, you know, they're bonused, right? They've, they've got on-target earnings. So it's not at all surprising that they do this, but the idea that they would just kind of go out, promise anything that the client asks for because it's the easiest way to get the deal over the line. They'll start writing dates into contracts to try and get that contract closed because, again, it's always that one thing that, that that's needed to get the deal over the line. And, of course, just come back, put a bag of manure on the product manager or the <laughs> client service team's desk and like just get them to sort it out because it's not the salesperson's job anymore. Now... I'm presuming that you don't work like that, given what you've been speaking about so far. But what are some of the ways that we can persuade salespeople not to do that? Because if they do do that, they're creating a massive problem for the, well, basically for the company, right? Of course. Yeah. So this is management. This is executive management. This is, this is a leadership problem. Because the minute you eliminate that motivation, the incentive, the compensation to do the wrong thing, then many of those problems will go away. In enterprise sales in particular, you're there for the long haul. I know people that are selling the same accounts for a decade or more. And, you know, they just know everybody in Citigroup or in GE. Yeah. And so they their whole livelihood is dependent upon the ability to deliver and be reliable and so forth. And so they 
they will, those people will, can't afford to maximize the compensation plan at the expense of their long-term future inside the company. But, you know, in a product-driven company that has sales that are one and done, or they don't have that long-term view of a customer relationship, you really have to make sure that senior management values that. Because, I, I yeah, it's, it's really important for salespeople to know that whatever they commit to, whatever they get the company to commit to, they have to have an appreciation for how difficult it is on the other side to build that thing or to make, yeah. m- to deliver. And I know because I am absolutely incapable of programming or developing anything <laughs> of any sophistication. But, but at the same time, I have a great appreciation for how complex enterprise sorts of solutions or really any SaaS solution is. Because the minute you get more than one customer's requirements and you got to put them all together, it gets things get hairy. And so adding new features and so forth, that's the common joke right now is, oh, you know, among tech founders is, you know, I'm going to make the sale if I just have one more feature. Yeah, and yeah, a good yeah. salesperson knows you can oftentimes make that sale without that feature. Yeah, you know? 100%. <laughs> yeah, no, it's like, I always call it the Columbo feature, like just one more thing, right? Yeah. And it's never just one more thing because actually they probably weren't going to buy anyway, right? Or they were right. going to buy anyway. And actually this was just a little cherry on top. So I think that it's an interesting point that you make about the founders as well, like or the maybe not the founders, but the exec team, including the founders, and it being their responsibility to kind of set the standard and to interrupt the, any bad behaviors that they see. But I guess one problem that you can see, especially if they're not tech founders themselves, is that maybe they actually think this is the way that business is done. And they actually do think that salespeople should be going out and doing this stuff. And therefore, it's kind of coming from the top. And I guess in that situation, it must be very difficult to change anything. Yeah, well, I mean, I don't, I don't know exactly how to, how to solve for that leadership problem. That's a big problem. That's a fundamental. <laughs> you can't do that. But I will say that among salespeople, I mean, one of the things, at some level, sales is sort of a, it's a, it's a game. You're playing a game, <laughs> and the game is, ba- it's a little like poker in a way. You, you have to play with, w- with whatever you're dealt. And I, I think part of the fun, if this is making sense, is that part of the fun. <laughs> Is being able to say no to a customer, and part of the part of the challenge of the game is being able to say no, we can't do that. And the thing about that is that when you can do that and look them in the eye and keep your backbone, <laughs> it's it's empowering because what happens is you find out how serious they are about that thing. Because many times they say they want a product, yeah, we don't do that. Or you say, we can't do that, but here's how we would solve for that. And then you sit there and wait and sort of say, what do you think? And then there's a moment of truth. You either figure out that they were just blowing smoke or they were just testing you or they didn't know what they were talking about or they're just investigating to see how you're going to respond. <laughs> but most of the, you'd be surprised. Most of the features that people need, they don't really need. Or you really, it's, it's worth validating. And this is what um, I'm in the process of recording a series of videos about uh, the discovery process. And this is a fundamental part of the discovery process. It's, it's qualifying. It's figuring out what does a customer really want to accomplish? What is it they're really out to do? Because this is where product management and sales ought to be on the same page. Well, like figuring out what it is a customer really needs and then being able to say no if you can't do it. Oh, 100%. And that's music to my ears. I wish you were selling for me. But you know what I mean? It's like, it, it, it's so variable, I guess, depending on the motivations, as you say, of the team, the compensation for the team, the culture of the sales team, the culture of the founders. So it's obviously a really tricky mix. And there's probably no one answer for it. But I think that ultimately, the point is, we're all going to get along a lot better if we're on the same page, right? And we're not just sitting there trying to sell random stuff just to get one person a bonus. So yeah, I definitely agree with that. But you talked a little bit earlier about the obviously going out and doing sales discovery and sort of unpicking the organizations and trying to work out their motivations and trying to work out what they need and the solutions that they need. And of course, that yeah. tends to resemble or sound a little bit like product discovery, as in the actual art of going out as a product manager on your own and going to speak to people in the field or you know, potential prospects or the market in general, if that's you know the, the ephemeral yeah. market that, that is out there. Yeah. 
so product people would tend to argue, rightly or wrongly, that salespeople, whilst they are talking a lot to the prospects that they get to talk to, and they're talking a lot to the customers that they land, that their feedback and the things that these customers ask for or say or the features that they say they need are very it's, it's like a narrow view because you can't talk to the entire market right right do you buy that argument like is your view so narrow that really it can't be genericized or do you think that you've got a pretty good thing on the pulse and that you're really trying to work out what's best for the market as a whole oh i i don't think that i think there's if you're trying to pin me into this corner where I say there's no need for product marketing people or product <laughs> management people, you're going to be mis- you're going to be dis- disappointed. <laughs> no, I, I mean I I might be as so arrogant as to think that I know what my particular vertical might need at some level or another. Like I was in, I spent a lot of time in telecom and a lot of time in in financial services, and then a bunch of time in healthcare. And so I could probably give you a decent feel for what a healthcare health plan might need because I call in enough of them that I see some common patterns and common requests and I understand the market well enough. And that's part of what a good salesperson brings is the overlap of the knowledge of their product and the industry and the problems that other people in that industry are having and how to and how you can solve them, all those sorts of things. But I believe that it's, you know, in a in any kind of company of any size, the salespeople should be wanting to get product people out in front of their customers so they can hear things directly. And the product people ought to be talking to salespeople as a normal course of business and not just when some feature is needed at the end of a quarter in order to make a deal happen. <laughs> because A, you can probably formulate a much better argument or solution to a potential problem if before the quarter ends, you've thought about it and you can present a solution that says that we'll, we, we, we have this in our roadmap and then, you know, in six months and, you know, and then, the, and then it becomes a scheduling issue as opposed to a, we're going to win or not win this deal issue. Yeah, I completely agree. I think that that alignment is 100% ideal. And I think there's also this thing that was just occurring to me as, as you were saying that, like if you're selling into the enterprise, and that's certainly what I've do and have done in the past as, as a product person yeah you're like this whole idea of product discovery and going out to the market and all of the stuff that product people want to do is obviously a fantastic aim and we need to desperately do that but at the same time if you've only got a total addressable market of like 20 companies or something like that yeah because of the type of vertical that you're in yeah you're going to be in a situation where you need to take as many signals as possible right so like you say you're going to need to speak to sales because they are speaking to these people all the time and actually the universe of people that they're talking to is probably pretty close to the actual universe that you could actually sell to so i think trying to get that alignment is absolutely critical and being all snooty from a product perspective probably doesn't do anyone any favors like it's only feedback if we get it like that's that just seems like a hiding to nothing right yeah yeah i don't like i i one of the things i figured out a long time ago is i'm usually not the smartest guy in the room (laughs) and i'm i'm okay with that and what i choose to do instead, and I think this is just a better role for a salesperson, is to be the kind of coordinator, the person that owns the franchise in a way. And that is, uh, if, if, if my account is AT&T or, or Citigroup or who, whatever, then uh, it's my franchise. And I want to make the best, I want to do the most I can in that, in that market, or if it's multiple accounts, that's the franchise. And what I want to do is I want to bring in the right people that can help me optimize that franchise. And there is no way, I mean, it's just unrealistic to believe that you're a better product management person than the product management person. And if you're, if you're the salesperson, because you don't have time to do that, it's not your, and, and so I think that it's, it's a team sport. It gets less so as the deals get smaller and the companies are younger because you, you're, you know, fewer people are wearing more hats, but, yeah. but the mindset doesn't really change right? It's still the same. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think also another interesting thing that occurred to me as we're talking is like this idea that, and you kind of touched it earlier around the kind of specials and the one-offs and that one Colombo feature that you need to get to win the deal. Yeah. Like if product people are actually out there speaking to customers either with salespeople or without them, 
it may well be possible for them to actually anticipate those features before people start asking for them, right? Yeah. Because they've already done that good legwork and good discovery in the first place. And I think the one thing that I think is missing is this idea in some companies that product people should be doing that at all. And that, you, know, you do have salespeople kind of guarding their accounts or guarding the customer discussions because they feel that that's their job. So I think that ultimately, from my perspective, it's like, if we can do what you've said and bring people together, again, either literally together or just agreeing that they can talk to different people at different times, then that feels like a much healthier dynamic. Well, and and uh, so now I'll get a little protective. And that is, <laughs> I'm, I'm completely in favor of having product people and other people inside the organization talking to, to my customer. I don't want them to do it without me knowing about it because <laughs> I'm orchestrating a big plan. And I want to know, as long as I'm in the loop and I'm part of it, and maybe this is me just being shallow, <laughs> but I want to know what's going on because like, I don't have to be the guy that knows the answer, but I want, when I talk to anyone in the organization, they go, I don't want to be surprised. Oh, this is happening. The best relationships I've had is like when the CEO, in the con- I've had this multiple times in, in, with large companies where the CEO will pick up the phone and say, hey, I want to talk to so-and-so. <laughs> oh yeah, I can make that happen. Or Brendan, I got a call with so-and-so and I want you on it. And man, that just, it makes everybody, it just makes everything work that way when you can do that. And the same is true with product people. I want, you know, product people are calling in my account and not telling me about it beforehand. That makes me mad. <laughs> and, <laughs> and at the same time, uh, you know, if they call me and say, hey, I, I want to call, I want to talk to someone, I'm happy to set that up. And I, I can tell them, here's what we got going on, or here's what, yeah. here's what they're going to hit you with. And they're going to be angry about this because this feature doesn't work and so forth, right? So, yeah, forewarning. No, I think 100% this whole idea that people just kind of go off piste is ridiculous. Like, again, if we go back to many of the things that we've been talking about tonight, it's all about teamwork and all actually being on the same team yeah. and not just being in two separate camps or doubting the motives or the intentions of the other, right? Yeah, exactly. Internal politics can be <laughs> the, the worst part of sales. <laughs> yeah, surprisingly large amount of politics, even in small companies. Yeah, that's right. There's a big movement at the moment around product-led growth and the idea that the future of product management and the future of product development is all about building products that sell and market themselves, upsell themselves, don't need salespeople anymore because it's all handleable within the product. I'm assuming that as a salesperson, you're not 100% on board with that, but like, What's your take on product-led growth? I mean, I guess it doesn't have so much of a sway in big enterprise sales, but have you come across it and had to defend yourself against it in any way? I think it's it's not a bad thing to strive for. And if you can design a product so that there's a limited amount of friction to buying it, then you probably don't need a salesperson anyway. I would argue that in a lot of cases, you want somebody selling early on because you don't have the product yet or you don't have much of a product. And so you have to overcome all the limitations and shortcomings of your product in the beginning. And so you need someone to sell. And that's the, in my, in my argument, that's your founders because they, you can't probably afford to hire a salesperson and you don't even know what kind of salesperson you want. Yeah. So there's almost like a life cycle where a company starts out, you got to sell on your own because you don't really have a product or it's a marginal product and your you know minimum viable product what have you and then at some point it evolves enough that it sells enough on its own right it sells pretty well on its own or with or with a limited amount of Q&A and so forth and then you go upscale up market and then guess what you need salespeople again because <laughs> now you're dealing with the very problems that make you important right and that is all sorts of new features and functionality and security and whatever, all the other things that the that you didn't need in the beginning. This is that Jeffrey Moore crossing the chasm, yeah, yeah, yeah. that whole thing. By the way, that's a great that's a that's a book. That's a uh, very good book. I recommend it yeah. to everyone. So if someone's going to go and build a SaaS product and they don't just naively assume that you can get there without having any sales. It I I don't it's that's tough. So there are people out there that build a really solid product and and you can probably get by without you know any significant sales but that's some real that's that's not easy to accomplish i don't think absolutely now i want you to imagine 
a struggling product manager sitting in the middle of an organization. They're in a team that has a very antagonistic relationship with the sales team because, you know, it's one of those types of companies. They've, you know, it's kind of maybe even kind of deteriorating a little bit and they're trying to work out what they can do, like their first step that they can do to try to build bridges with that sales organization and get that relationship onto a little bit of a better track. What's that one step that you would advise them to take first of all? Oh, man. If, if, uh, well, salespeople being what they are, they want to look good for their customers, right? And so if there's, if there's something, that, that, that product management can do to make one or more salespeople look good or position them well with an account, that's a great way to start. And so what am I thinking about? Uh, like if you could, you had a beta or you had a new feature, you want to test some new fe- set of features out. You could make them exclusive to a certain number of customers or a certain number of salespeople. Hey, this is something that you can bring to your customer and they can, or you build up some sort of a executive forum. You know, we're going to have a group together and we're going to do some sort of a thing and we'd like one of your customers to be there and you to be there. I think we want to be listened to, right? We want to be valued. <laughs> it, sounds, <laughs> it sounds ridiculous when I say it like that. But, you know, if you're trying to, if you're trying to win someone over, you know, if you can win them over with their client, with their customers and make them more strategic, more like, oh, this salespeople as, as treat them as like, oh, they're the executive for the account. They're the sponsor for the account. They're the single point of contact. And then you kind of butter them up that way. That's probably the simplest way. I mean, I'm sure I could come up with a dozen others. but. <laughs> That sounds like a blog post. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Fair enough. I'll try it tomorrow with my sales team as well and see what I can come up with. And where can people catch up with you after this if they want to speak to you about sales or products and sales or maybe even just share some war stories? Oh, sure. And and I do this little thing where I do consults for free for 30 minutes. So if you have a technical, like a sales problem, you know, you can. So the best way to reach me is in Twitter. It's Brendan McAdams, all one word. And it's brendanmcadams.com is like my listicle. What, is that what they call it? Is it a listicle? Oh, I don't it's know. A, I'm too old to know about that sort of thing. And, uh, you know, it's my with a one page website. And then, um, yeah. And then kinetics is K I I N E T I C S dot com. Those are, that's how you find me. A cornucopia of different options to get in touch. I'll make sure to link <laughs> them all into the show notes. Well, that's been a fantastic chat. And we've obviously made it through it without killing each other. So, I think there is some hope for product and sales, you know, if we can keep this going. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously, we'll stay in touch. But as for now, thanks for taking the time. Oh, Jason, it was a pleasure, man. I enjoyed it. Thank you. As always, thanks for listening. I hope you found the episode inspiring and insightful. If you did, again, I can only encourage you to pop over to onenightinproduct.com, check out some of my other fantastic guests, sign up to the mailing list or subscribe on your favorite podcast app, and make sure you share it with your friends so you and they can never miss another episode again. I'll be back soon with another inspiring guest, but as for now, thanks and good night.